Welcome to our continuing 2018 educational webinar series. I'm Katherine Short, Partnership Marketing Manager for First Healthcare Compliance. At First Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business. A hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We are so, so pleased to have Stephen Dickens, attorney and vice president of medical practice services at SVMIC with us today. In this role, he advises physicians and their staff on organizational issues, including governance, operations, strategic planning, leadership, patient experience, and human resources. He is a published author and frequent speaker at state and national conferences on these topics. Mr. Dickens has spent the last 25 years working with physicians in various roles, including 15 years in medical practice, hospital, and home care executive positions before joining SVMIC in 2008. He is the past chair of the Medical Group Management Association, having served as the first solo chair of MGMA ACMPE, which, has, which had more than 33,000 members during his term. He is the past president of the MGMA Financial Management Society, Tennessee MGMA, and Tennessee Association for Home Care. He is the board certified medical practice executive and a fellow of the American College of Medical Practice Executives. In addition, he has previously earned a fellowship in the American College of Healthcare Executives and the certification as a home and hospice care executive by the National Association for Home Care. He is a 2015 recipient of the Martha Johnson Distinguished Service Award from the Tennessee MGMA honored, honoring his contributions to the organization and the medical practice profession. He was Tennessee's Home Care Administrator of the Year and received the President's Award for Service to the Industry from the Tennessee Association for Home Care. A copy of the slides is available for download on the control panel. Feel free to submit questions in the question box on your control panel during the presentation. Your PACOM and PMI CEU certificates will be emailed to you following the broadcast. Your PACOM certificate will be uh, will come directly from PACOM, and your PMI certificate will come from our email. There is no need to request either one. Additional CEU opportunities will be available to BC Advantage members following the live broadcast. See their website for details. A download of the handout is available with a button on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. So, Steve, welcome. Well, thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Oh, all right. Well, it's so great to be here with everyone today. Today, we're going to be talking about what I'm sure is one of everyone's favorite topics, and that is progressive discipline. Uh, in my experience, most managers find this to be one of the, the least satisfying aspects of their job. But the, the reality is most of our job as managers and leaders is spent dealing with other people. And as hard as one tries to hire the right person, sometimes it just doesn't work out. And when it doesn't work out, that means that corrective action plans, progressive discipline may become necessary. And unfortunately, sometimes termination is required as well also. So for today, our objectives are to discuss the importance of progressive discipline. We'll talk about what you need to document to protect yourself as an employer going through this process. And then when it does become necessary to terminate an employee, what is the best, easiest way to do that? Now, given that we're at the end of the year, I assume many of you are probably preparing for annual evaluations. In my experience, many organizations do them all at one time, and the beginning of the year seems to be a good time for that. I know I personally am working on evaluations for my employees, but whether you do them all at one time or whether they are rolling evaluations and do done on employee anniversary dates throughout the years. My experience is that most of us really do not like to do them. And when you survey industry leaders about the value of employee evaluations, only 6% of 
of CEOs say that evaluations are useful, and another 94% find them useless. And the reason for that, I believe, is because evaluations are not being used effectively. When appropriately done and used in the right way, evaluations can be very helpful. And that's the key to it. You have to make sure that it is a meaningful experience for the employee. There should be no surprises. Uh, it should be something that the manager has been working on throughout the year. What has gone well? Have you worked with the employee as, as you've been going along? What can we do better? Employee evaluations really ought to be about bringing a summary and conclusion to what has occurred over the past year, but even more so looking forward to what is coming in the next year. Where does the employee fit into the organization? What is the strategic plan? What are what should be his or her contributions? Are there their specific goals? What does the employee want? It really, if done properly, is a great opportunity for the manager and the employee to connect about what the coming months should look like. Now, unfortunately, the typical evaluation does not always look that way. I've I've said it on far too many of them. You you have the employee that's it's not doing a very good job, but you, you don't want to hurt their feelings. You you don't have the right words to say. And many times managers will end up rushing through this process and they'll check you know, meet expectations all the way across the board. And, and then they'll try to, to sugarcoat or gently throw out, oh, well, you know, I wish you could work on this. Maybe this could go a little bit better. And in the end of it, the manager oftentimes is so nervous and so apprehensive that they almost end up apologizing to the employee that they even have to do the evaluation, that they have to go through it. They'll they'll brush it off and say, oh, there's there are really no problems. This this will just take a minute. There's there's nothing here to discuss. So what happens is that the employee walks away without any sense of expectations, what he or she could do better with, and when things do go poorly and it becomes necessary to follow through with progressive discipline or even a termination, the employee is left surprised and shocked and, and wondering, well, how did we get to this point? Where did this come from? So let's talk about what should be happen happening in employee evaluation. First of all, employee evaluation should always be documented. There should be written proof of what happened during the course of the conversation. And this requires some honesty on the manager's part. Not every employee meets expectations. Uh, it, it simply is a reality. Even the very best of employees may be excelling in a particular area, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing what they need to be doing or what they can be doing across the board. One of the most important elements as you are doing evaluations for your team is to be consistent across the group. If you judge one person according to one criteria, a similarly situated person doing the same job or with the same job title should be judged exactly the same way. And as you are being consistent and as you're being honest, you want to make sure that your complaints are appropriate and that you have you're able to back them up, you have substantive information, and that only permissible metrics are being used in the evaluation. It's not about the employee's personal life. It's about their performance uh, at a supervisor one. And the most amazing things would, would show up in the evaluation, whether you attended the Christmas party, whether you participated in voluntary company events. Those, those things aren't right. Uh, it should be about has this individual done his or her job? Have they met the goals? What are the future goals that you want them to work toward? And when you do identify weak areas or, or problems for an employee, you must have the conversation of not only what are the expectations moving forward, but how do you expect this person to get there? What are the steps you expect them to take? What are the tools or resources you're going to provide to them as well? But at the end of the day, there should never be a surprise. When you sit down with an employee to do an evaluation, they should know what's coming. You should have dealt with problems as they occur throughout the year. You should have congratulated and recognized successes as those occurred as well too. Because the point you want to be at is when you do have to do progressive discipline or when you do have to terminate an employee and they walk in, 
you should be able to look at them and ask the question, do you know why you're here? And their response should be, because you're going to fire me. So it's very important you have that open and honest communication throughout the, the course of employment. Looking at doing evaluations, uh, many people have the idea, well, let's do the, the really bad employees first so I can get that done and get that out of the way. And, and then, you know, it's kind of a downhill slide from there. I would, I would challenge that thinking. Uh, you really should do evaluations for your best employees first. And there are a few reasons for that. Um, first of all, it, it differentiates the high performers from the low performers. And so it allows you to go ahead and meet with those good employees and they get the good news. And that then allows them to go out and start saying, hey, I had a really great evaluation. And, you know, the boss is in a really good mood. And I really appreciated the, the positive feedback I got because that will spread throughout the company. Whereas conversely, if you start with the poor performers, they're going to come out, oh, that was awful evaluations. You know, she's in a really bad mood. I can't believe he said this to me. And that will feed out across the organization. So part of it is culturally driven that you want people to recognize evaluations are a good thing, that you are providing uh, important information back to them. And also, if you start with the really good employees first, it'll make you feel better about yourself which will build your confidence as you're working through this process also. Now, as we talk about performance, you need to differentiate employees who can't do a task versus those who will not do a task because it, it changes how you deal with them. When you have an employee who cannot do a task, well, they probably need training. Um, you need to work with them. What are the tools they need? What are the resources? What is the education? Uh, do they need a mentor? Uh, because that gives you the opportunity with the proper training to get a successful employee because there are only two paths. And either the employee is successful, which is a win for the employee and a win for the organization, or they're not able to learn the requisite skills, which means they have failed, and it becomes necessary to terminate them. Now, for employees who won't do the task, uh, there, are, there are some extra steps there. First of all, you've got to ask the question, is it because they don't understand what they're supposed to do or because they don't want to do it? Many times, employees simply don't understand what they're supposed to do, or even if they do understand what they're supposed to do, they see it as a menial or meaningless task that it doesn't matter. And that can be a generational issue across all the spectrums. So you want to have the conversation with the employee. This is what I need you to do. This is why I need you to do it. This is why it's important. And then they go down one of two paths. Either they, they recognize this is something that has to be done, done, they comply, and again, you have success, or they continue to refuse to do it, and you move toward termination. If it's the employee who simply does not want to do it, that's where your progressive discipline starts because you need to issue the warning that they need to comply with your expectations. And if they do, again, we've saved the situation. If they refuse after the warning, then the next step down the path is moving toward termination. There are some important steps to a performance improvement plan, and it really begins with identifying the problem, documenting it, and then having the conversation with the employee. Once you've had that conversation with the employee and you're satisfied that they understand what it is that has gone wrong, it gives you the opportunity to summarize that to the employee while providing your expectations and what the deliverable objectives are. And you will define what is that time frame. And you want to be specific. You want to, to make sure that you've given them expectations that are measurable and follow up on those. You know, we're going to sit down again in a week. We're going to sit down in two weeks. We're going to sit down in 30 days, whatever it is that's appropriate, because it is incumbent upon you as the employee supervisor to review their progress. If, if I'm really trying, but I'm still not getting there, well, maybe we need to tweak something. Maybe I missed a key element. So sit down, meet with them, review what's going on, and if necessary, tweak the process as needed. When you have these progressive discipline meetings with an employee, here's your script. 
Susie, I, I need you to come into my office today and um, I want to talk with you about a situation. I've, I've observed your work over the last few weeks and I've, I've become very concerned that, that things aren't going well, that you're having difficulties with this particular task. And, and I'm beginning to see a pattern here. And this pattern is, is going to be problematic. It's going to be detrimental to your success in the organization. And we, we value you. We value your work. We think you can be an important member of the team. And that's why I want to give you the opportunity to improve. So here is what I need you to do. And then you fill in the blanks. And I'm going to need you to be successful with this within 30 days or two weeks or, or whatever the appropriate time frame is. And then as you talk through what success looks like and how you're going to measure it, what the time frame is, it's very important that you come back to the last bullet here. Susie, I need you to understand me. This is very important. If I do not see change, if I do not see significant improvement during this probationary Step. The next step is, and then whatever that next step is, whether it's um, whether you suspect you'll move to suspension or whether you suspect you'll move them to another position or whether indeed this is important enough that the next step would be termination, whatever it is, you need to look the employee in the eye and say the words so that he or she walks out with complete clarity of what is going to happen next. Now, body language is very important with all this too. When, when you are really working with an employee in a collaborative manner to help him or her, I encourage you to get up from behind your desk. Come around to your desk, sit down at a conference table. You still want some formality, but you want to come across as I'm trying to help you they, they need to get the importance of the situation, but how you approach it will also impact their mental state of mind. Okay, I, I really know that, that he wants me to do well, and, and he believes that I can do it, and, and it just changes the dynamic. So again, I really encourage you to get up, come from around your desk, uh, sit across from one another, sit at a small table, but show the interest and show the seriousness. There are some really good reasons we want to follow progressive discipline. First and foremost, if you do end up in a litigation situation or there is an accusation of discrimination, you've got a written record of why it is what you've done, and it provides this written record to your employees to know what the expectations are, what are the consequences if they fail to meet those, and if you do then have to terminate the employee, the map is drawn, the, the story is told, the, the rationale for the suspension, the termination clearly exists. And believe it or not, sometimes it actually works. Employees do get better sometimes when you have these conversations with them. Don't go to the negative place and assume, well, okay, I just have to do this. Actuality is most employees really do want to succeed. When we look at why we want to discipline employees, there are obviously a lot of, a lot of reasons, and it, it relates to performance, to have they violated their contract, do they have a disruptive behavior, have they done something unsafe, they're, they're not meeting our productivity standards, they're, they're late all the time, or, or they're just, you know, absent, uh, you know, perhaps they're insubordinate, and, and many people don't get the definition of insubordinate. Uh, when my boss tells me to do something and I ask a question or offer an alternative point of view or suggestion, that's not insubordinate. That's, that's questioning, that's conversational, and refusing to do what I've been told to do unless it's unethical or illegal, that's insubordination. I, I know a lot of people that you know they, they don't want any back talk with their employees. They don't want any questions. And so they just immediately jump to the conclusion, oh, well, they're insubordinate. I'm going to terminate them. That's not actually true. And if you've developed the right culture in your organization, you want employees who feel empowered enough to, to ask questions, to offer those alternative points of view. They might actually save you from making a fatal mistake if, you, if you're not careful. In terms of the typical process for progressive discipline, it begins with a verbal warning. And, um, 
it's some type of counseling, and that may be, you know, they step to your office or you catch them in a private place, or whatever it is, make sure that you are having those conversations in private. A verbal warning, you won't have an employee sign off that you've done it, but you want to make sure that you have noted somewhere that you've had that conversation, because when you move to the next step of a written warning, you're going to document this conversation, and you are going to reference well, remember two weeks ago when we talked about this, I haven't seen a change, so we, we need to move on, and I want to make sure you get the significance of it. So that's why we're writing this down and having this conversation. Beyond that, it may be appropriate to suspend the employee or demote them if they have been promoted to a position where they can no longer be successful. And then finally, of course, we move on to termination. This is the standard process in most organizations. But be aware there are occasionally incidents where whatever it is, the infraction, the, the wrong deed is so severe that you may need to skip steps. And for me, that's generally an issue of safety, uh, an illegal activity, or an ethical activity. Uh, if there is a concern for coworker or patient safety, certainly you want to remove that that person from whatever that situation is. And, and if you know what they're doing to be illegal or unethical, in my mind, those generally require immediate action. Okay, so we've had to move on to progressive discipline. We've talked about what that looks like. We've talked about what a corrective action plan looks like. What is the documentation I'd want to see? I want to know the date we had the conversation, the activity occurred, what was the incident that prompted it, what did we talk about? Uh, was there a specific policy or violation that was violated? And you will do this as these incidents occur. And if the employee acknowledges that they've done it or whatever language it is that they use, I, I understand what I've done or yes, I did that. Put that in the record, you know, Susie said, Johnny acknowledged so that if you do need to move on, to additional steps, you can show as part of your record, well, the employee knew they did it, they admitted that they did it, they had knowledge of it. And a really great way to explain these types of things, especially when you're talking about attitude behavioral type issues, is to talk about the impact on the practice. Uh, managers talk about, well, you know, they're doing a good job with what they're supposed to do, but you know, they just can't seem to get along with anybody. Well, that's the effect on the practice. You're not able to develop a relationship with your coworkers. I'm not able to assign you to work with other people. Uh, those would be the kind of things. Most people have difficulty dealing with those types of issues, but they do have an impact on the organization without having violated a specific policy or procedure. So that's how you have the conversation with the employee. The typical termination Again, it's one of those types of things where it makes most of us nervous, none of us like to do it. I still remember the first employee I terminated. My, I was probably within the first year of my job out of school, and so my boss was there with me as a witness, and as, as I look back on it now, it probably was in many ways just comical, and it, it was just, I felt worse than the employee did, I sure, but when you've done all of this lead-up work to a termination, you can feel good about yourself. I have never terminated an employee that I didn't feel badly about it because I knew that these were people. Somebody cared about them. They had people that they cared about. They, they were working to make a living to take care of their families. But the way I've always been able to get through it is to know that it wasn't a surprise and that I had done what I was supposed to do as this individual supervisor. And it was this person's actions who caused us to be where we are. So that's the other reason for following this process. In order to be able to have a clear conscience that you did everything you could for this individual. Now, when do we terminate an employee? Well, if it's um, a performance related issue, you wanna follow progressive discipline. If it's misconduct of some sort, you would expect to conduct some type of investigation to document that. Otherwise, 
again, patient safety type issues, employee safety issues, illegal, documented, unethical activity, you're going to terminate them now. Make sure that you aren't making up reasons. Uh, I talk to, to people frequently say, oh, well, we're just going to eliminate the position and lay them off. And Well, are you going to hire somebody back? Well, yeah, we have to hire, have somebody. That, that is just trying to get around the situation. You're setting yourself up for an employment claim there. Honesty is really hard, but it is always, always the best policy to follow there. Now, what about the logistics of how to terminate someone? There should be two people in the room. You should be completely prepared, which means that you've got any severance ready, you've got a final paycheck, you've got any required forms, the release form. This is not a debate. It's not a discussion. Don't let yourself get drawn into an argument, into the tears, the accusations, all of those things. Once you reach this point, the decision is made. I'm here to terminate you. This is why I'm terminate you. I recommend that you go into it with a termination letter that you hand to the employee and say, here you go. You can follow along with me, but I'm going to read this to you. And it should outline you know, any key information they need about COBRA, accessing retirement benefits, who's going to follow up with them, uh, note what it is that you've given to them, note why it is that you've terminated them. And that's it. We're done. There's, there's nothing else here to discuss. Now, there are two schools of thought on when is the best time to terminate an employee. Uh, a lot of people follow the theory, well, you want to terminate someone early in the week because then they don't have the weekend to wallow in, and it gives them the opportunity to go out and, and start looking for a new job. I do not adhere to that theory. Um, that is not generally in the best interest of the organization. And let's be realistic. If you fire me today, I'm not going to go out and start looking for a new job today. I'm still going to wallow. I like terminations at the end of the day, at the end of the week, because it helps stop some of the gossip that is going to be inevitable because everybody else who's still left at the office is going to know what has happened, and they're all going to be chit-chatting about it. Try to control the situation, which means you want to have this conversation in private. You want to make sure that there's a witness there, that you have anticipated any contingencies, which means that you've thought about do they have a key to the building? Do they have a security card pass? Do they have passwords to our computer system? How are we going to get their stuff out of the building? Are, are we going to have them take it now? Are we going to ship it to them? Are we going to make arrangements for them to come back? Uh, if this is a contentious situation, do I need to think about having somebody on guard? Do I need to think about security? I have lived through all of those situations. I've, I've been in organizations where employees were terminated, and we, we had the foresight to think, okay, maybe we need to – to be at the ready in case this gets ugly or, you know, this employee works in a very public area. Can someone go in and clear out all their coworkers so this person can go back in peace and clean out their desk? Um, would it be better if someone came in and met this person after hours or whatever it might be? Had a call from a practice just a, a couple of weeks ago, as a matter of fact. They had terminated an employee, not thought through this process, let her go back to her desk to clear out her personal belongings, and she changed the password to her computer. And it was not a networked computer, and all of their billing information was on this computer. And she left and essentially wanted to blackmail them into getting the password to get back into the system. So you, you need to think about those things and, and what it's going to look like when they walk out the door. At the end of the day, Employees really should terminate themselves because you followed progressive discipline. There are no surprises, though. So when they walk in the office, you simply ask the question, do you know why you're here today? And that is what an optimal dismissal really should look like. And once it's over, you need to document how was it executed, what was said, you know, were there threats of hostility, were there any claims of discrimination made, and then what was done, what was given to the employee, what was taken from the employee. And remember, uh, you cannot withhold pay if they, they've not done your work, you know, this is, you know, unless this is some type of contractual arrangement, um, which I'm not talking about here, but the, the typical hourly employee, if they've worked, you owe them money. And 
you, you just need to pay them. You just need to cut your losses and let it go. How do we announce the termination in the organization? Well, let's be honest. Everybody knows what was happening, but you want to protect yourself from any type of discrimination. You don't want to get caught into a situation where the employee alleges you were talking about them. So the less you say, really, the better. What everyone wants to know is, how does this impact me? So focus on how the continuing work of the organization is going to be done. And when you're asked questions, you simply refer to it as a confidential employment situation. Um, in my own organization, uh, when an employee would leave, we would always get an email. And you could tell from the tone of the email whether the employee had resigned or whether the employee was set free to seek new opportunities, as I like to put it, because the email that came out for the employee who was resigning, oh, we wish them well, this is what they're doing, blah, blah, blah. The employee who was terminated, we got an email that said, John Smith no longer works here. Everyone else should not be able to tell the difference. And we, we changed that um, some time ago. So now when an employee leaves, we get an email. And unless you have intimate knowledge of the situation, you don't know. Did they leave to take another job? Were they asked to leave? Was this part of a progressive discipline process? Don't know. It should simply be they no longer work here. If they come back, you treat them as a guest. Who do they need to check in with? Any any type of logistical information I need like that. But but the announcement should look the same across the organization. Whether or not to pay severance is an individual situation decision. And some organizations do that if they're laying off a large number of employees to soften the blow to help them out. Uh, sometimes it's done with uh, very long tenured employees. There may be something contractually obligated. There may be something in your policy. But whether you, or not you decide to do severance uh, is an individual decision. If you're offering severance because you're concerned there's a potential for some type of accusation, I really recommend that you consult with your HR counsel or your corporate counsel to talk about, okay, does this send a signal that, that we're scared that we've done something or is it the right thing to do? Is it some way to put it off? But when you do severance, you want to make sure that you have a written agreement and the employee must be given the opportunity to, to review that, know what they're signing. Uh, you probably want to encourage them to, to talk with their own counsel uh, and to look at that, there may be negotiation here. Uh, all contracts require consideration, and so you're agreeing to give them money. What are they agreeing to do? Maybe they're agreeing to not file suit. Maybe you're agreeing to give a satisfactory reference, or they're, you're agreeing not to contest unemployment if they apply for it. Again, giving severance can be a sticky area. So if you are for any reason considering it, I really recommend that you talk to your counsel before you move forward with it. So how do we avoid the shark-infested waters of human resources and all the trouble that goes along with that? Well, best advice is to be consistent because every discrimination claim starts with the accusation I was treated differently because this, this, or this. And the reality is, if you treat everyone the same, if no one is treated differently, then there is no basis to the claim. You have the choice to be fair or to be consistent. And if you have not figured this out yet, I'll let you in a little secret. Your employees don't think you're fair. Doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter how you do it, they are never going to see you as fair. So what you want to be is consistent. And at the end of the day, we expect consistency. And the reality is it's much easier. Make sure you avoid all the protected areas, the Civil Rights Act, the Age Discrimination Act, the American with Disabilities Act, because there are, at a minimum, 11 protected areas that include race, color, religion, national origin, age, disability, genetic condition, veteran status. Uh, all of those types of things, and then individual states can also add other protected classes as well, too. So make sure you are aware of what the protected classes are in your local area. And make sure that you aren't creating reasons to terminate individuals. Um, 
there is no way to prevent an employee from filing an EEOC complaint. I've dealt with two of these over the course of my career. And whether true or not, they're a pain, in, pain to deal with because, you know, the EEOC requests all this information. You have to provide answers to the request. You have to provide your policies. You have to be able to demonstrate a legitimate reason for the termination, that it was not wrongful, that it was um, not in any way based on a discriminatory reason. And the EEOC can choose to investigate the situation. They can choose to mediate it between the parties. They can choose to pursue it with their own legal action, or they can choose to let go of it, and then the employee has the right to pursue legal action. Uh, the first EEOC complaint I went through was um, an allegation of age discrimination, and it took a considerable amount of man hours and thousands of dollars in legal fee just to respond to the complaint. Now, luckily, the employee, she was, she was angry. She had been part of a group layoff and realized that it really had nothing to do with age and dropped it. A number of years later, was involved in a second EEOC complaint um, alleging sex discrimination. That one drug on for over a year. Multiple employees were interviewed. It was it was a constant thorn in everyone's side who was having to deal with it. And so they become very expensive in terms of both time and money. The trouble spots in human resources are when we violate the rules, when we don't pay minimum wage, or we aren't paying overtime, giving comp time, uh, you inappropriately um, classify an employee as an independent contractor when they really should have been classified as an employee. Someone comes to you saying, I've been harassed or I've been discriminated against, and, and you don't do the appropriate investigation or you just brush it aside and say, oh, well, you know, they didn't mean anything by that. And for healthcare facilities, one of the biggest areas is commingling employment issues with healthcare issues. Uh, in working with physician offices, I find it is very common for physician practices to treat their employees as patients as well, and, and I understand it. Uh, the employees know the doctors, they trust them, it's easy, it's convenient. The doctors think, you know, it's far less expensive for us to provide this care at no charge than it is for them to go somewhere else, to take off work, to use insurance, all of those types of things. It creates the potential for the supervisor to have access to confidential healthcare information that he or she would not have otherwise had but for the fact of the employment relationship. It always blows up in your face. And again, I get it. You know, you work for the only OBGYN in town, or you know, these are the best cardiac or orthopedic guys in town. This is who I want to see. This is who I, I I want to take care of me. I understand all that, but do let me caution you. You need to be careful when you are seeing your employees as patients. Now, there are a number of required records, and I'm not going to go through the list. You've got the the site there at the bottom. Uh, these are federally required records. Again, your individual state records may vary uh, in terms of what is required, and these are the federal retention records as well. Again, understand your state laws may require too, but at a minimum, you are required to do this. If your state law is stricter, then that is what you will have to follow. The best way to avoid HR problems is to make sure you're hiring the right people. You know, Take the time, do the research. Are you pay, paying a fair wage? Um, are you advertising in the right places? Are you picking the right candidates? Spend some time looking at resumes and, and doing the phone interviews, the face-to-face -face interviews. Uh, background checks are required for many healthcare employees, and again, those laws vary state to state as well, too. Make sure that, that you are looking at the history. If you've got someone who's working in a building office, so do you want to look for past criminal activity? Uh, do check references, look at that, be ready for the employee's first day, and when you hire someone, the best person to orient them is your best employee. The temptation is always to let whoever has the most time do this, but you want to make sure that the person learns to do the job the way you want them to do it. So take the employee who does it the way you want them to do it, 
and have them teach them and be ready for them the first day. What are they going to need? Do they have a work area? Do they have a computer? Do they, do they have office products? All of those things. Be welcoming. Take them through the building. Make sure that they're, they're introduced to everyone. Let them know where the restroom is. Talk to them about where they should park, what time they should get there, what is the dress code in the office. All of those things in helping prepare them for their first day at the office. In terms of checking those references, I find many people say, oh, you know, they don't tell you anything anymore. They're not any good. And, and I understand that. Um, there are a lot of employers out there who've taken the stance. I don't want to say anything about anyone because I'm afraid I will get sued. But I do still think that it is worth the effort. Ask the potential um, employee, the candidate, for the name of a former superior or a peer. Um, uh, someone that worked for them, what would they say about them? Uh, be thorough, ask the questions, and you learn after a, a period of time the way people answer questions that can tell you a lot. Are they eligible for rehire? My favorite trick, though, is to, when you are talking to references, ask them, well, is there anyone else you think I should talk to about Susie or John or, or whomever it is? Now, you don't have permission to call that person, but what you can do is take a note of their name, go back to the candidate and say, oh, when I was talking to one of your references, they suggested that I call John Doe or Mary Smith. Would you give me permission to do that? Because a lot of times, while the person may not tell you anything negative, they'll give you the name of somebody else that they think might. And, and how the employee responds to that, whether they say, yes, it's okay to call them, or no, I'd really rather you didn't, may be telling in some sense. So just a, just a little tip that sometimes works. Looking at the top 10 termination mistakes, failure to document and to go back and look at and, and being inconsistent in why it is that you've terminated the employee or, or mishandling those meetings or the employee's belongings. You, you hear something and you don't investigate thoroughly what it is that you need to be doing. You, you jump to conclusions. You know, you believe uh, something that someone else tell, tells you without verifying it for yourself. Uh, again, the guilt, you know, oh, I'm so sorry we have to do this. Well, it's not your performance that has led to this. Uh, sometimes saying too much at the termination can be harmful. That's why it's really important that you go in with a script and you stick to it. Those instances where maybe severance would have been a good option and you have failed to do so, should you consider legal counsel? And you know whether you should or shouldn't. Don't go cheap. If you know you have a potential problem situation, take the time to reach out to your legal counsel because I promise you it will be far less expensive than if you improperly terminate someone and end up with a discrimination suit. Failure to adhere to your own policies and procedures and to be clear and, and concise in the termination. You don't handle the announcement to the rest of the employees properly. You give them too much information. And you mishandle the, the personnel file in some way. So again, if you take the time, if you document, you put everything together, I can follow the, the picture, the map of why it is you've done what you've done, and you share only the information you need to share, and there has been no discrimination involved, and you have been consistent, that is what lessens the likelihood of there being ramifications from a termination. So your takeaways for today, develop job descriptions. What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to do it? Conduct meaningful evaluations on a regular schedule. Treat all of your employees consistently. When you do have an issue with an employee, resist the temptation to talk to other people who report to you or to talk to peers of this individual. Go to your HR director. Go to your boss if you need to get advice. But no other person on the same level or below the individual with a problem should ever know what is going on with that individual beyond what they see with their own eyes. Be consistent in following your progressive discipline policy. Deal with problems as they occur. And then manage your emotional intelligence. Do not, off the top of your head, lose your cool and fire someone. Take a measured approach. Step back. Look at the situation rationally and think about what is the right thing to do here. And be warned that you will never save enough. Um, 
to justify inappropriately paying a patient or inappropriately terminating them because anytime you seek to see cut corners, you run the risk of ending up in a situation where you're going to pay more in fines, penalties, or legal fees than would have cost you to do the right thing. At the end of the day, I like to tell people the real secret is that you want to hire for attitude. You can't teach it. You can't fix it. You can't correct it. So determine whether or not the individual has the ability to do the job. But when you have two similarly situated candidates, you want the one who has the attitude, who's going to fit your culture, who's going to be able to integrate themselves into the organization. And that is it for today. I'm happy to take any questions, but do want to point out there are a number of resources here at the end of the presentation for you. Well, thank you so much, Steve. That was really very informative. And we do have a few questions, so I wanted to get to those. Right. Okay, so um, you mentioned that record, you mentioned records that the employer is required to keep. Is there a requirement that I give an employee access to those records? Oh, that's a great question. Um, whether you have to give an employee access to his or her personal records is dependent on state law. Some states require that employees have full access. Some states are silent on the matter. And, and it can vary not only state to state, but it can vary by the type of employee in the state. For instance, many governments require that state employees have access to their records, to their performance evaluation, whereas an employee in a private organization may not have that same right. So I encourage you to consult either with your state Department of Labor or your own legal counsel. But when people ask me this question, I always look back at them and say, what do you care? What, why do you care if your employees can see their personnel file? There should be nothing in their personnel file that they don't know, that they haven't seen, or that you haven't told them. So. I, I see no harm to letting someone see that you don't want to let them take it off so that they can remove something from it. But mm -hmm. to give them a copy or to be there and be present while they're reviewing it, I, there, I see no issue with that, even if your state doesn't mandate it. Okay. And then what are your thoughts on comp time? Don't do it. It is. <laughs> comp time is, is a dangerous situation. Um, any employee who is paid by the hour must be paid for the time that they work in the pay period that they worked it. And, and I realize some employees want comp time. They, they come in and say, oh, well, you know, I've had to work overtime this week. I've, I've worked 45 hours this week. You know, just let me leave five hours early next Friday. And you think, oh, okay, well, I'm doing the employee a favor. They've asked to do it. It's great. Well, the problem with that is the employee can come back at some point when they become disgruntled and uh -huh. say, well, you didn't pay me my five hours of overtime, and they have a right to get that, and you will have to pay it. Exactly. So, yes, don't, mm. don't do comp time for hourly employees. Now, how you choose to manage your salaried employees, you know, my, my personal opinion is there is a salaried employee, if I've done any portion of work during the course of the day, I've worked a day. And so they're salaried employees, and you are prohibited from federal law from docking a salaried employee uh, based on the quality or quantity of their work. Generally, we see salaried employees as professionals. Now, yes, you can require them to take personal time off, vacation time, sick time, all those types of things. But but that that is a different situation that you have to manage. But don't do comp time for hourly employees. Okay. Um, what about, are there, there's many types of evaluations. What type do you like best? Uh, I really like a free form evaluation that looks back at the past successes and issues that have been addressed, but spends most of, it, most of its time looking at tasks and goals for the next year. Uh, many organizations use scales, you know, rank the employee one through five or one through three or you know, acceptable, unacceptable, and, and those are all fine because they, they get to the task at hand. But what I think is the most valuable is the conversation, and that's what 
that's what I we use here now in my current role. They really um, are a free form evaluation, so it's meant to document a conversation. Now, I do think you still have to evaluate tasks. You know, if you have a medical assistant, you have a nurse or a billing person, you know, are they able to to do those things? And if you have a task checklist, I, I think that's fine. But I really do like an evaluation that makes use of documenting a conversation. Okay. Um, do you have any final bits of advice or, or thoughts on that? Uh, you know, HR is a landmine, and most of us don't like it. And it is too easy to think, oh, it'll go go away. Oh, I'll talk to him later. Oh, it's not that big of a deal, and it will snowball. You, you have to stay ahead of it. You have to stay on it. And just, it's you know, they say it's like eating frogs. You know, just deal with it first thing and, and go on. Good. Very good. Well, um, thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate this. I know that our attendees are really going to enjoy this. And I really appreciate that. A lot of uh, really useful and informative um, information. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, well, thank you, Catherine. You're very welcome. I hope everyone okay. has a great day. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you do as well. Uh, attendees, please use the contact information on the screen for any questions. Or if you send us any questions, we'll forward them on as well. Um, please remember your PACOM and PMI CEU certificate will be emailed to you for uh, from within two days following the broadcast. There's no need to request it. You can register for future webinars or request a demo of our compliance solution on our website at firsthcc.com or call us at 888-543. 4778 and thank you for joining us.